Well, I want to start by saying how proud I am of Stephen. I remember the day I got a call from him seven or eight years ago when he said to me, you know, I have this idea that nothing is going to go right unless somebody does something about it. Because certainly corporations and governments are not going to change. They're not going to tell you, by the way, to take responsibility for yourself. And the reason being is they can't control you at that point and they can't exhume money from you at that point. And governments are in the pocket of these corporations worldwide. So it started humbly right here in New York at a university that you have. And I think it was six years ago. And we did the very first Real Truth About Health. And Anna Marie and I talked for over 30 hours. But that's not hard for me, I'm Irish. I said, how come we don't have another 30 hours? <laughs> and then we started to discuss the possibility that there are other truth tellers. There are other people around the world that are experts in what their endeavor is. On the environment. On views as Joel just gave us in his perspective in health. And we then started to bring in people, Stephen started to bring in people, and this conference is by far the epitome of what's been conducted so far. You're going to listen to 32 people who have deep experience and are not going to back down from telling you what they believe. Sadly today, the professions in the world are under the thumb. Because even if they believe that you should be responsible, their hands are tied and they cannot tell you that. They cannot tell you that. If they do, they'll either lose their license or lose their job or in some rare cases not be with us anymore. So now let me give you a little bit of my perspective on what's going on on the planet today. And this is actually titled The History of Life. It's very short, don't worry, we're not going to go back the billions of years. We're just going to get into the millions of years and excerpt what the important high points are. When I became acutely interested in biology and science as a young man, I got in a position where I started to doubt what I was reading. I started to question what the status quo was, what the standards were, what in fact was being taught at the great universities around the world. And when you start to question the authorities in this who tend to develop a deep sense of arrogance because they're really well equipped to regurgitate what the generation before them learned and the generation before that regurgitated what the generation before them learned they become quite offended when you ask questions how many of you have noticed when you go to your physician and ask for descriptions as to why you should take a medicine or why you should do something else, quite often they either dismiss you or, in fact, ask you not to come back again. So I don't know where we got lost, but we got lost along the way as we went into what we fashionably call modern society and greater culture. I think it's almost an oxymoron. We have less culture than we've ever had. All you have to do is watch American television for five minutes now, and you know that. And we have less depth and less humanity than we've ever had. We are more lost than we've ever been. And it wasn't so many years ago, back in the 19th century, that in fact, the people most revered in their communities were the people with the most common sense. The people who knew how to farm the best. The people with the biggest heart. The people with the greatest compassion. The father figure, the mother figure. And when we got caught up then, moving forward into this so-called modern culture and society, we completely flipped that and we made the people at the top of the pile 
the intellectuals, the people who had the greatest education, the people who were the most estranged from common sense. I had some teachers and professors along the way, brilliant in front of a group. They walked outside and they trip. And so we now have completely shift our dream of who we want to be to something abstract, completely abstract. It doesn't even look like something that is normal at this stage. And I started to question the sciences. As an example, when I was studying anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, I would ask questions about something as simple as an enzyme. Now, in mainstream medicine, an enzyme is considered a protein. In fact, I found out through going into quantum physics and quantum biology, the outer shell of an enzyme is a protein, but what it really is, that inner shell, the essence of an enzyme, is to carry electric to our electric bodies. Isn't that amazing? And I started to question, when I began my work nearly half a century ago, if we're electric, why does nobody talk about this in mainstream science at this point? And I started to search out people that were really at the cutting edge of medicine and healthcare, and they said, yes, in fact, we know we're electric, and yes, in fact, we're disenchanted with our fields, and yes, in fact, until we become cultured and civilized enough to accept us as electromagnetic frequencies, we're always going to struggle with health care. We're always going to struggle with pain and suffering and discord and disharmony. Another area I looked at is what we think about as healthy food. Well, it was really interesting. When I first became a vegan, vegetarian, first macrobiotic, vegetarian, vegan, and then raw food vegan, all along the way, everyone was saying fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables. And by mere chance at Hippocrates Health Institute, because we don't only deal with serious health seekers, we deal with people who are seriously ill. That's what our reputation for the last 62 years has come from. And we started to notice that people with visible tumors, cancerous tumors, when they ate fruits, the tumor often would expand. Now that was nowhere to be found in medicine. I couldn't find one bit of writing in any language, and I searched and searched and searched that said, fruit was bad for you. As a matter of fact, you're going to hear speaker after speaker after speaker the next 10 days tell you how great fruit is. And by the way, fruit is much better than the pork chops I used to like. Much better than that. And I had to look at agricultural science, because the agricultural scientists, they don't talk to the biological scientists. And the physicists, they don't talk to the biologists. And I started to read it all, speak to them all, and pull it all together. And I found out from agricultural scientists, man has messed with fruit to such a point that we cannot consume it as we did before. In this presentation, you're going to see that at one point we were fruit eating. No question in my mind about it. No question in your mind by the end of this presentation that that's going to be true. But we hybrid those fruits, starting with the Chinese thousands of years ago, not for the wrong reason, but they realized that the woman or man at the market that sold the most fruit had the sweetest fruit. So they kept crossbreeding, crossbreeding, crossbreeding with the sweetest fruit. And so a lot of things that on the surface look like absolute normal information I've been on veiling myself for all the decades that I've done the work. I've written a book to expose, for instance, the supplement industry. It is no doubt in my mind that over 90% of supplements are not only not good for you, but they're dangerous to take, with a big D. Because they are made out of chemicals, petrochemicals. We're not talking about the average chemical, we're talking about the kind of chemicals they make plastics out of, and roads out of and the oil in your car out of. I exposed the myth around fish. If you go to the average holistic doctor today, 
at the beginning of the 21st century, they're actually going to tell you, fish and fish oil is good. I'm writing a book right now with Israeli scientists. Once again, rehashing what I wrote in Killer Fish and exposing that the largest studies in history, in Finland as an example, on fish and fish oil. Show us. If you consume fish oil and fish, you will have two times more heart attack than if you don't do it. Now, how is it the information is that warped? That the doctor you trust, the alternative doctor, who, by the way, the fish oil industry paid for the last holistic conference they went to. And they are so busy and so tired and they didn't learn a thing in school. So they happen to believe the proponents of fish oil who supported that last conference that they heard. Rather than look at the studies that are there. Harvard University, three occasions, challenged and questions the fish oil story. Dairy deception. When I was a boy growing up, dairy was actually peddled to us for free. We all became not only addicted to the fats in dairy, the hormones in dairy, that's the greatest addiction you have, the hormonal addiction to it, the sugars in dairy, the lactose in dairy, but they scare you too. It's guerrilla marketing. They say, you know, if you don't drink that dairy, man, your bones are going to crumble. And I'm thinking my bones are going to crumble. So I took dairy. When eggs went out of fashion, when finally people realized that one egg has 230 grams of cholesterol and how much cholesterol do we need? None. None. Zero. Then the egg industry came back with vengeance and said, are you a real person? So all of you who don't know who you are, you're lost, you're confused, you're trying to find yourself, you want to be real, so let me eat some eggs. <laughs> this is how they do it to you. Clothing. How many of you knew clothing can give you diseases like cancer? Neuron diseases. I won't name names, but America's top fashion designer, when I wrote the book with Anna Maria, I went to her, not far from here, and I said, you know, you're on the Hippocrates diet. You know what this Hippocrates diet does. You know what it's done to save lives. I'm going to give you this book. I want your name on it. I don't want my name on it, because nobody knows who I am. You are the top fashion designer in America, if not the world. She threw me out. Because in that book I show you, I prove to you, and if you read the book, you will get what I'm saying, that clothing can give you disease, maybe even more so than bad food, since you wear clothing most of the time, unless you're a nudist. <laughs> Which would be fun, by the way. Could you be a nudist vegan at a nudist vegan camp? Hey, that's, <laughs> that's sort of seductive. Maybe I'll start one of those. <laughs> maybe we'll have nudist programs at Hippocrates, right? Every other program, you have to be nude. <laughs> we'll be packed with people. In my latest book, we're going to talk about tomorrow, Poison Poultry. The other sham. Everyone wants to be moderate. Nobody wants to shake the boat. My God, well, you know, I go, you know, I'm going to come home. I'm going to be a vegan, a whole family. What's a family going to say? At least if I eat a little chicken and turkey, they're going to be fine. Tomorrow you'll see, I'll quote over six decades of work from one of my colleagues, she's now gone, Dr. Virginia Livingston, who showed us that, by the way, Poultry out of the meats, out of the flesh that people choose to eat, the muscles you choose to cook and eat, causes more cancer than any other meat. You're going to have Dr. Campbell here. He was the one that enlightened all of us. We knew that milk and yogurt, including the Greek variety, and kefir and cheese and butter and ice cream was bad for you and gave you disease. But we didn't know until 1990 when his brilliant landmark study called the China study came out, that it caused more cancer than even meat. We did not know that. But now we know that. And the good news is at the Institute I've had the privilege and I've been proud to direct, along with Anna Maria since 1980, our founder knew that. When she healed advanced stage 4 cancer, when the Harvard doctors gave her 90 days to live, and she said, forget it, went home in Boston, and healed stage four cancer. She knew you couldn't eat anything but vegetables and nuts and seeds and grains. And somehow 
I believe there's always a spiritual intervention, even if you and I and me included are not smart enough to know it. If we wake up, the message is always there. Only half of us are asleep most of the time, so we don't wake up. And it came to her, if you sprout the seed, it's got to be powerful. Well, the angels of truth have come around us over the last decades, and scientists worldwide have now confirmed everything we've been doing clinically on hundreds of thousands of people for now 62 years has unbelievably strong, irreputable, unshakable science behind it. This is no longer questionable. What's questionable is why aren't you doing this? What's questionable is why aren't governments coming to us and saying we've got to multiply these places 35 a day in every city? Because if you are still depending upon a government economy that's based upon pain, suffering, death, and dying, we will not survive as a human race. And if you participate in that, you are part of the problem. Every time you take a morsel of so-called food that isn't food into your mouth and swallow it, you basically participate in that. Every time you sit and become angry rather than decide what passionately you're going to pursue that day, you are part of the problem. Every time you buy into negativity, you are negative. And these are not profound truths. These are simple truths that are profoundly ignored. Isn't that the weird part of this? When I was a young man growing up right here in the New York area, all I had to do is be tough. That was it. Men just had to be tough. Where does that get you? Nowhere. Wouldn't it be nice if you taught little boys to be sensitive, empathetic, compassionate, and loving? And we taught little girls that they could do anything they want to do, and they didn't have to act like boys to get respect. They could act like women. They could act like girls. Wouldn't that be nice? And may we have people at that point that don't want to kill themselves by eating hot dogs at Yankee Stadium. My grandfather and I used to go to see Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris to eat hot dogs. Shit, I was sitting this far from Mickey Mantle. I should have been, I was more interested in the sauerkraut on the hot dog. <laughs> so let's get on with our presentation today. And we're going to breeze through where we all came from. Hello, I'm... So this is the earth that you live on. It's a remarkable earth when you actually think about it. You're sitting out in the middle of one universe that's actually part of multiple universes. We now know that there is no stop to the universes. That they keep flowing and flowing and going and flowing and flowing and there's not one universe. Although at Harvard and NYU they're still teaching the physicists there's one universe. And why? Because in 2003, we blew it out of the water. Because in 2003, the Mars probe went up and they did photographs. I won't have time this weekend to show you this, but I actually make a presentation, showed the photographs made there. And they actually saw one universe pouring into another universe, expanding, another universe, etc. And we come down from that space we come down to the earth, and the earth was completely covered by water. There was one ocean. You, by the way, were in water for the first nine months of your life, hanging upside down, floating in your mother's womb. And until we had our last child, who's now 22 years old, we didn't do a water birth, but when we did that water birth, it was remarkable. Because my little boy came out, and the midwife was there, and I said, can you watch that boy? He must be Einstein. He's a genius. He swam right up to the breast. And the midwife said, they all do that. <laughs> the very first life that was in that water you see on the screen, that's called blue-green algae. That's your most distant ancestor. That's why your body is 70% water, and that's what gave life to you, to the planet Earth and all else. Then at the bottom of the oceans, we had plants grow. 
And that's where all omega oils come from. Matter of fact, why fish have omega oils in it is because they eat those plants that you see. The blue-green algae and the sea algaes at the bottom of the ocean. And all of that accumulated to a point where land came up. Now most of us, because we have never really been taught history, and the history of life certainly we haven't been taught, and if you were, it was incorrect, even if you went to an Ivy League university. The very first land that came up was this wonderful land that we call a continent and a country of Australia. How many of you knew that? Australia is one million years older than any other land on Earth. And it's the coolest place in the world because who else has koala bears? I mean, you ever see a koala bear? You could take the most negative person in the world, show them a koala bear, they're going to want to hug it. <laughs> and then kangaroos. Kangaroos are even hipper than koala bears. Kangaroos are like beatniks. You know, they put the baby here and they bounce. <laughs> and they look at you. It's, look at that shit. Can you do this? <laughs> Nobody can do that. Bouncing around with a baby in there. Now that beautiful piece of land that we call Australia, the very first creature, your greatest, greatest ancestor came. And this is what that creature looked like. Pretty scary looking thing. Look at that. That's called a trilobite. And it crawled up on the earth. And at the same time, the trilobite can you imagine, does that look like your uncle? It looks like a lot of the people in Washington, doesn't it? <laughs> Matter of fact, the kingpin most resembles. <laughs> but the reality, quite simple, is at the time the trilobite was coming, the algae flowed as Anna spoke this morning in her talk, got into the cracks on that land and created grass. So the very first plant, land plant, was grass that became redwood trees. Isn't that amazing? Became the bushes in your yard in Long Island that you're trying to have a good looking house. <laughs> it became flowers. Can you imagine that we make Bach flower remedy out of? So it's unbelievable when you really look at life, the history of life and where we came from. We actually came from a plant. And that plant became this creature called the trilobite. And when the land came up, it needed food for the creatures that were going to evolve over millions and millions and millions of years. And the first food was grass. The first life form was algae. The first food was grass. So at Hippocrates, since 1956, we've been focusing on the very first life form on the planet, which is blue-green and green algae, the very second life form on the planet, which happens to be sea vegetables, and the very third life form, grasses, and their cousins and brothers and sisters called sprouts. Now, there's lots of theories about foods. And I know it doesn't sound good. Fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables, to say you've got to eat algaes and grass. But the reality is, I'm giving you real history here. I'm giving you real science here. I'm taking you to the core of reality, and I'm taking you to where we've been for 62 years, doing clinical research on hundreds of thousands of people, and watching the results of eating these foods. Now, I'd love to be challenged, but you couldn't find somebody to challenge that history. We're talking about natural history, we're talking about human history, we're talking about life, we're talking about studies, we're talking about science, we're talking about proof. What was remarkable for me in 1975 when I joined the team in Boston at Hippocrates, in those days, almost 100% of the people that walked into the doors were told they were going to die. Now, you think Brian is embellishing this? No, Brian is not embellishing this. Because in 1975, nobody would have thought to come to a health center unless they were thinking, I may die. That's it. Now, there were 3% of us that were hippies that liked to go there. That was it. Everyone else... They had to crawl in. You know, we've always had something because we're not a hospital. You have to be able to walk, talk, function. And they did it until they got to their room and that was the last I saw them. <laughs> and I'm watching these people get better from one catastrophic disease after another. One after another. 
All of us that eat this way and live this way, it's not only eating, you know, it's your attitude and exercise and everything. It's not just food. I wish it was just food. Damn it, it would have been a lot easier. We just don't become decrepit and weak and angry and sick and age the way the rest of the people do. Why? Because when you plug into the universe, knowledge, and wisdom of life, you plug in. You're not in the wrong socket getting 220 versus 110. Now, can you imagine that trilobite became these things and a lot of other things? Look at those animals. I mean, a zebra. Just look at a zebra. I freak out when I see a zebra. I saw a zebra recently. I said, how did that come about? You know how that came about? Where the zebra lived, he needed camouflage. And so nature, God, the universe, wisdom, put those stripes on the zebra. The graph lived in the middle of the most arid place on the planet, and they couldn't eat, so they developed long necks so they could now eat food at the top of the tree. If you don't think this is brilliant, no wonder you're sick. No wonder you're out of touch. No wonder you're unconscious. You can sit home all day long. Uh, you're not going to get anywhere, man. Feel happy about who you are, your life. So millennia's biology unified to sculpt nearly 9 million known species. The sad part is how many species have we not identified and wiped out? Do you realize that they're estimating that we lose 35 species a day we've never identified? Now, remember, species aren't only looking like zebras and you. Species can be microscopic because you're really just a gathering of microscopic, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Now here's what our belief system was. Because you've been taught, and I guess at Oxford and Harvard and McGill and Stanford, the well-endowed intellectuals basically will get up and say, we were hunters and gatherers. I challenge that. We were not hunters and gatherers. We became hunters when your goofy European ancestors went so far north they were almost dead because it froze. That's what became hunters. And by the way, I guess I would have been a hunter if I and my children were starving at that point too. But up until then, and most of the world today, up until then, and today at the beginning of the 21st century, most people are plant-based eaters. We're so caught in our cocoon of deception, you think everyone thinks like a European or American. We don't. And so we were not running after animals. You'd be goofy to do that. If I gave you a choice, let's go out and eat tonight. You say, well, that sounds good. I say, okay, now, take this knife, and you have to run faster than that animal. Kill it, and we'll eat. Or, by the way, look down. There's some plants. What do you want to do? What choice are you going to make? Plants all day long. So this concept that they're teaching at the highest levels of education in academia and so-called history is completely wrong. Because six out of ten people today are plant-based eaters. What do you think? We were all eating animals. Now six out of ten of us choose not to eat animals. So here's really what it looked more like. Pretty sexy, huh? You wish you were there in those days. <laughs> So primal people were gatherers and consumed plants, their rightful substance. How do we know that? Well, you're going to see that in the upcoming slides. But how I know it is I've worked with 267,000 people in my nearly half century of work, and 100% of those people I put on an organic, plant-based diet and done clinical analysis of what happened, and I watched them get better. That's how I know it. Now, I can also introduce you, as I will, to everyone from Dr. Furman to Dr. Esselstyn to Dr. Campbell, who's going to be here, who in their own unique way look through their own unique window and will also confirm. This morning you heard my wife, Anna Maria, speak about the latest study on centurions, people who live to 100 years old. How many of you were here for that presentation? She basically said it clear. 
the latest study, largest study ever done globally on 100-year-old people and beyond, showed that the vast majority were plant-based eaters. We were stunned when they published that study out of a very conservative New England Ivy League group. They can no longer deceive you. Why? Because last year, get a hold of this one, 2017 was a breakthrough year for plant-based diets. We increased our numbers by nearly a thousand percent. Give yourself a hand if you're a vegan. <laughs> nearly a thousand percent we went up last year. And you wait because this year it's going to be more. James Cameron, all of you know him through his Hollywood fame. Brilliant, brilliant producer. I cried half the way through Titanic. <laughs> Wasn't that a sweet movie? The love scene, mm, the older lady, romantic. Avatar, for you thinkers, Avatar. Well, he's a vegan. He and his wife I've met, I know. They have a wonderful school in Malibu. Most of our kids couldn't afford to go there, but <laughs> it's a lovely school. And they serve them plant-based diets. And not too long ago, about two years ago, he basically said to Arnold Schwarzenegger, Arnold, why you're getting old, why you are getting sick, is that you eat animals. I always knew Arnold, deep down in his heart, was a smart and good guy. He said, okay, I've become a vegan. <laughs> so very soon, I want you to keep your eyes open, write it down, put it in your cell phone so you don't forget it. They're coming out with a movie on vegan athletes. And they're going to show you the strongest, healthiest, highest endurance, most conscious athletes in the world are now vegan. I've trained some of those athletes. And before my time at Hippocrates, Muhammad Ali was on the Hippocrates diet for two of his fights. Brady, who I'm not a football enthusiast myself, Tom Brady, I know that's a dirty name in New York, has been on the Hippocrates diet in a moderated form for 15 years. His wife is on the Hippocrates diet. So everything you've been told, hunters and gatherers, when I was young, you want to have muscles, eat meat. You want to get feminine, eat meat. How many of you know that story? Number one, you're not meant to eat meat. And the larger the animal, the more estrogenic the animal is. So if you eat a lot of animal foods and you start to have a lisp and walk funny, now you'll know why. And women, by the way, you're going to gain mustaches. Be macho. You're going to talk back to your men. You start eating meat because your body freaks out and starts to create a lot more testosterone at that point. This is what we look like. I mean, that's what I used. I used to go with my buddies when I was a kid and say, let's go to the steakhouse. Just show our masculinity. You know, I put my chest out. And it was hard for me because my belly was about that big. So I, if I stood upside down, it would have looked like my chest. <laughs> I used to say, give me, don't even cook it. You know, just, you know. Right? Don't even cook it. You know, chew it. Is it good? Yeah, it tastes good. <laughs> Biologically, humans thrive on plants and are not anatomically able to digest, utilize animal-based fare. Period. You say, well, how did we get along for so long? We haven't. We haven't gotten along. In modern times, it was only two generations ago other than a handful of the elite, the aristocracy, that people ate large amounts of animal food. Your government stepped in and started to subsidize here and globally evil, evil industries. The meat industry, the dairy industry, the sugar industry. How many of you read the New York Times a month ago on the sugar cartel? Where they actually assassinate people. You talk about drugs? I don't know of a worse drug on the planet Earth. How about the latest study that came out just in December, mid-December, they now have confirmed, which I didn't even know when I wrote my book, Sweet Disease, that all sugars, including fruit sugar, are 20 times more addictive, two zero times more addictive than cocaine. So forgive yourself for saying, I'm not on sugar. I eat a gallon of agave syrup a week. It's just sugar. My buddy and I used to buy one gallon of honey, this is not a joke, one gallon of honey a week. 
And I'd have big mouth open jars, so I'd put my whole damn hand with the whole wheat bread in there and eat it. I'd be licking my thing. Of course, it was natural. Sounds familiar? I won't ask you to raise your hand. <laughs> so now we're going to show you the absolute bottom line fact on why we're not animal eaters. If you look over there to the far left in your case, that's what a carnivore looks like. So when these so-called health experts are being taught at universities that we're carnivores, first thing they ought to do is look at this picture. Now, how can we be teaching that almost lock, stock, and barrel globally to our kids in nutritional science and dietetics? And by the way, not look at that picture. You tell me that's not detached from reality? Any of you here have a mouth like that? Raise your hand. Because I'd ask you to leave instantly. Instantly. <laughs> now next to you have an omnivore. Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan's one of the greatest writers in modern times. You ever read The Omnivore's Dilemma? Love Michael Pollan. Greatest article on why we have such a sugar problem was in the New York Times Sunday edition about 15 years ago on high fructose corn syrup and weight. And he paralleled the more we use high fructose corn syrup, we got fatter and fatter and fatter, and it's a done deal. He thought we were an omnivore. Michael, who, by the way, eats this way, should have opened the mouth of an omnivore and saw we don't have that. Then we have herbivores. This is where we start coming in. Your mouth is much more like an herbivore and like a frugivore, if you notice that. When the people who don't know any better, including the professors, say, well, why do you have fangs? Show me the fang. You have teeth, as you're going to see in the next segment, with the top anthropologist on human diet in the world's history. These are to rip leaves. I do it every day, by the way. I'm eating leaves. I rip them every day. They are not as a fang would go in and take a big chunk of flesh, muscle, out of a creature and swallow it. And there's very few carnivores. I don't know how many of you know that. We need carnivores. Because when bodies die, what cleans them up? Carnivores do. You're just not one of them. And when you eat a carnivorous diet, and I don't want to be elaborate because we could be here for two hours on this one slide alone, your intestinal tract doesn't know what to do with it. You have an elongated, elaborate, sophisticated intestinal tract with villi in it that push along plants and, by the way, collect and accumulate in the large intestine and it's cellulose that feeds healthy bacteria. Most important thing I've just said, so listen closely. Cellulose, plant fiber, feeds healthy bacteria. What happens if you eat the old diet I was on? I had no cellulose, unless I ate a piece of cellophane by mistake when I was opening the meat. <laughs> that was about the only cellulose I had. And in fact, flesh rots and decays and brings its own breed of bacteria in and completely distorts the healthy bacteria that is 70% of your immune system. So no wonder we're sick. You're putting ungodly things in the body that can't come out for three days. I'll repeat it. Three days, eggs, dairy, fish, pork, red meat, wild game, whatever that is. Wild game sounds like, you know, a rock band somewhere. This is why we are absolutely able to prove without a question, without any Doubt what we're telling you is factual. This one segment alone. This is not my opinion. This is the history of life. This is who we are. Now listen closely. Anthropologist Peter Ungar uses casts of jaws, teeth, and skulls to study diets of ancient animals and how they have evolved over time. Here's a gorilla skull. The teeth on this thing are huge. They're also very crusty which makes them well suited for uh, grinding up and shearing and slicing leaves and other tough vegetation. 
Ungar and his team at the University of Arkansas study microscopic scratches on thousands of teeth from primates to dinosaurs. Eating hard things or tough things could be hard work. For years, scientists believed that because early hominids had huge teeth and jaws, that meant their diets were made up of tough stuff like seeds and nuts. But using new tools like these, Ungar can see minute wear and tear. You can see sort of the nice wispy scratches across the surface. Our ancestors were like us. They'd rather eat something soft and tasty than something hard to crack and chew. It seems big teeth and jaws only suggest what they could eat when food was scarce, not necessarily what they did eat when tempting fruits were plentiful. When we look at the microscopic wear on those teeth, it's actually quite rare that we see the heavy pitting one would expect of a hard object feeder. More often, they're sort of light wispy scratches, which is what we see in soft fruit feeders. So how do you like that? So again, if you went today to Princeton or Stanford or University of California and became an anthropologist, they would be teaching you the bad information, the wrong information. They'd be telling you hunters and gatherers. Here's the first man. This is showing you how we're not as smart as we think we are. The very first man in history that says, well, let's really find out what's going on. Let's look at the teeth of every creature we can get our hands on from the beginning of time. And what did they discover after they looked at every single bit of teeth from your ancestors, from dinosaurs, from everything they could? This is this man's life's work. For decade after decade, this is his life work. Here's what they determined. That you were built to eat soft things like leaves and fruit. And the only time, get a load of this one, the only time that we ate nuts and seeds, as they found from the geologists, were times of drought. When there was nothing else left, of course we ate a nut and seed. This is why, by the way, at Hippocrates, we say when you eat nuts and seeds, you must always germinate them. They become what then? Plants. They become plants. So how much more evidence do we need, people? But how long will it take for this information, this data, to change all of the literature written at the top universities in the world to get and be disseminated as truth into the public. Probably won't happen. Just like the blood tests we look at today were developed when your mother was alive and your grandmother was alive in some cases. And we don't change because it becomes the standard. I started out by saying to you today, that the people who stand for the status quo are once again regurgitating what the generation before them said, the generation before them said, and the generation before them said. We've institutionalized deception. Isn't that weird? Now, wouldn't it be nice if science was really science today? You know, if you look up what science is, it's the study of, not the absolute. When we make science the absolute, it's the opposite of science. It's anti-science. So what I try to do, I know my wife and I try to do on a daily basis, we get up, open-minded, to radically change and improve everything we've ever believed the day before and decades before that. And unless you're in that position, in my view, how dare us stand here and say we're health experts? How dare us stand here and say that we really mean to help you? Because we don't. All we're trying to do is feed our own ego by doing what we always have done. Just last week at Hippocrates, so it goes back to the story just before Christmas. It was sort of a cosmic Christmas gift. We use one of these wonderful technologies. I've been using electromagnetic and cold laser technologies for, since 1970s. When I became director in 1980 at Hippocrates, I brought them in. And I've actually spent two and a half million dollars on these technologies, which all of you get as part of the program when you come. That's part of what I give you as a gift. And I had waited a long time to get this machine, and I won't name the name, but it's really popular now. And I used it for a month and a half, and a good friend of mine, a Russian doctor, came in. Oh, I love this guy. He's a truth teller. He's never told me anything that didn't come from his heart, and I love that. He came to Hippocrates, reversed his cancer. He was conscious to begin with. That's how he was able to do it. And he brought a couple into me and he said, you know, they have this new technology that's out of Europe. I said, oh, damn it, you know, it's a new, I don't, 
I don't want to spend, I don't want to look at it, I don't want to spend the money. It was one of those days, you know. Five minutes later, I bought the unit. I threw everything else out that wasn't pertinent. Threw everything else out, $20,000 worth of stuff, and now the entire place is loaded with that. So just before Christmas, I had one of my really, really bright friends come to me. This guy is like beyond a physicist, whatever that calls. Physicist plus. He's from Hawaii, really laid back, you know. He's still like in 1968, I think. Walks around like this, Richard, and hmm. And he took one of those machines apart. And he came to me on about six, seven days before Christmas. He said, how would you like to project this frequency all over Hippocrates' property 24 hours a day? I said, well, how are you going to do that? I thought they were going to say, buy 15 machines. <laughs> I would have said, nope. <laughs> We'd have to mortgage the place to do that. We did it. We put it on the roof of Hippocrates. So now 24 hours a day, it goes through the same frequencies that go to what we call zero point gravity, the origin of all life, the origin of life, that harmonizes every cell in your body that literally starts to recreate homeostasis so that disorder is not in a friendly environment. What did I just say? Helps to push crap out of your body disease out of your body, disorder. And I actually have seen it not only on a biological, physical basis, but psychological basis. We're now talking about the new frontier of science that I don't know how many days, weeks, months, years, or generations it's going to take to be applied, but I know that this is where we are today. Just sadly, 99.5% of everyone would go against this because they are standing for the status quo. The most arrogant people I know are the people at the top of their field most often. Because they don't want to be questioned. I want to be questioned every day. I want to be challenged every day. I want to be told I'm wrong every day. And I want to learn something new every minute. You might as well die if that's not where you are. And believe me, my wife does a good job at that. So our elaborate and extensively long, remember the extensively long part of this. Elimination canal is fueled by plant nutrients and their cellulose roughage. Never forget that. So when people say, where do you get your roughage? You say, I get it from raw organic plants, not from something in a can that was a byproduct of an industry that made white flour. <laughs> they have conned all of you at the health store. What is rice bran? Crap. <laughs> what is oat bran? These are waste products. They used to cost millions of dollars a year globally to get rid of these things. Now they sell them to you for $3, and if it's organic, $3.99. <laughs> and you're just happy. I'm getting my roughage. Two-thirds of our body is literally bacteria. How many of you know it? When you get up in the morning, how do you smell? That's one way. <laughs> You'll know it. <laughs> so two-thirds of what you are is bacteria. Your intestinal microbiome requires plant fiber to multiply the pre- and probiotics that manifest 70% of your protective immune system. So now we're looking at disease and aging. Right now, just focusing on disease and aging. The number one biological reason we age prematurely and disease is what we're now discussing. If you don't keep the bacteria in your intestinal tract balanced, strong, and macho, your immune system is going to get weak and feeble and every disease is going to beat your ass. And that's what's happening in our culture now. It used to be it took us 50, 60 years of horribly bad living to get sick. Ha ha ha! I have babies, two and three years old. I met a young man, 42-year-old man here in this room this morning. I had tears in my eyes. Talked about his four-year-old child who's had, who has lymphoma. It's completely caused by the pollutants that he has fed that child unknowingly. He's not a bad father. He loves that child. But he didn't know that even the health foods that you often buy at the health stores have this garbage in it. He didn't know that the mattress polyester mattress, outgasses, chemicals that the baby was brought up on. The mother didn't know that she shouldn't be taking red dye in the food 
when the baby was in the womb. They didn't know that putting a cell phone at their head 10 hours a day was affecting the baby. But that's why we have the real truth about health, so you know. And you can't say, I don't know. Because you're not going to hear this on television. Joel was so funny today because he was right. When we get on these mainstream shows, they prime us for half an hour. Can't say this, can't say that, can't say this, can't say that. How many remember Regis Philman? We all like Regis, you know. Kathy Lee and Regis. Well, his producer came to Hippocrates. Happened to be one of those magical weeks where 80% of our guests return, most of for holidays. You know, once you come, it's not like a hospital setting, it's a resort. We have 12 pools, saunas everywhere. We dance, we have fun. You're supposed to be having fun when you get better, by the way. You have to be probably, oh, it's very serious, you have to get better. You're so serious, you'll never get better. You've got to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have some fun. That's it. That's why hospitals and doctors, all, even the holistic doctors, very pious. Oh. You put a questionnaire out. You know, by the time you're done with the questionnaire, you're sick. It's 32 pages. <laughs> and it brings back every bad memory you had. What happened when you were one? What happened when you two? <laughs> by the time you get into the doctor, you're sick. But anyway, what we do know from that experience is that it's much easier than we think. If you get the bacteria in your intestinal tract to work, your immune system works. Your immune system works. You live longer. Your telomeres last longer. Your age will be greater, and you won't suffer. That simple. You just won't suffer. And by the way, another way that the New England Centurion study just showed us that. Who lives the longest? Mostly plant-based eaters who exercise and have good social what? Skills, communication. Talk. The recluses all die, and nobody knows they died because they're recluses. So th there's this story here. We went into the house. It was very foul-smelling. <laughs> you want to be friendly, even if it's not in your nature to be friendly. Go out and say hello to people. Socialize. Join clubs. A lot of interesting things out there, I'll tell you. This is our team. Since 1956, our medical team has worked with hundreds of thousands of people in a clinical setting, all who adopted a completely organic, uncooked, plant-based diet. So we're not one of those people that say, oh, it's for you, it's the blood type diet, it's the paleo, it's the Atkins diet. We don't, this is nonsense. That's all for wussy people who don't want to do what they need to do. So if you're a wussy person, I don't know why you're sitting here listening to truth. You should be out eating a paleo diet tonight or checking your blood to see what meat you should consume tonight. Or worse than that, getting on my old friend who I was very angry at because he was one of the bright guys I ever knew, Atkins diet. He died from his own diet and they made up a story. He really didn't die from that. He tripped on ice, but it was July. <laughs> Go right along with the program, people. I'll be there at your funeral. Go right there. One of my friends years ago, she came. She was crippled with arthritis. The poor woman, it was painful to watch her. When she would sit in her wheelchair, two or three people had to lead her down. She was in her 50s. Got on the program, died at 97, was playing 18 holes of golf seven days a week and swam for an hour every day. Ellie Oster from the Osterizing Blending Company. And Ellie became one of my good friends. She purported to me she was a Christian. I believed her. She was one of the nicest people I ever met in my life. Most people that tell me they're religious, that's a red flag for me. Okay. But she was really authentic. And she said to me, you know, the biggest concern, I was a socialite. My whole life, I was a socialite, she said. I had to entertain. She was part of one of the political parties up in Wisconsin for years. And she said, I got home from Hippocrates. I was on a very strict plant-based diet. And this goes back to the 70s. Remember? This isn't recent stuff. We're now, you talk about plant-based diet. She said, every one of my friends were appalled and shocked and felt so bad for me and wrote me notes. What are you going to do? How are you going to socialize? And she said, I'm not. And she said, all of the people, I watched them. The ones that spoke the loudest died the soonest. But each of them who spoke, I went to their funerals and I prayed for them on their graves and said, if there is a next time, 
Let's hope you do it the right way. Isn't it sad? I have one guy that came to us. He is unbelievably sick. Seven years ago, they gave him one week to live. One week to live. His entire body is riddled with cancer. God on our program is alive. I am pretty strong. I go to the gym. I do pull-ups. I do dips in my late 60s. It doesn't faze me. This guy makes me look like I'm a wuss. He does one hand pull-ups. One hand pull-ups. He said to me, I said, you think you're ever going to die? He said, yeah, I'm waiting for my doctor to die first. So. <laughs> I have a he said, the day my doctor dies, then I'll be ready to die. <laughs> he said, I have an ongoing bet with him for the last seven years that he's going to die before me. I said, how does he look? He says, I think he's going to go pretty soon. We're going to give you some facts. Healthy weight regulation occurs with all participants. Is this a weight loss? We have a weight loss diet because people were as big as I was. I mean, I was really fat, you know. I sit here now acting like I'm a big shot in health. Why I'm a big shot in health now, I was scared shitless. I thought I was going to die at 20 years old. I was so big, I couldn't walk. Couldn't walk through doors straight. I, you know, when people weren't wa uh, looking, I'd go through sideways to the door. Smoking dope, smoking cigarettes, you know, like that. And was frightened, so I changed. I wasn't enlightened, I was frightened. I said, whoa, <laughs> I may die, I better do something. <laughs> and changed. And met the right people, series of the right people that led me in the right direction. You know, anyone that tells you they, they do this all on their own, none of us do it on our own. We have good people. Saints come along. If you're smart, you listen. God's voice is there inside of your heart. And it led me to this. And people say, oh, you work so hard. I haven't worked a day in my life. The day I'm working, I'm going to quit this. If you're not passionate about what you do, you're not going to be good at what you do. I'm going to tell you right now. The day I feel this is a struggle, I will quit. Why? Because I'm on the wrong path at that point. Most people do things because, oh, i got to make a living. Matter of fact, the latest study just came out. I reported this recently. Uh, where they went to Europe and North America and they asked people, you have a choice of two words. Your work, what you do to make a living. Either you love it or you hate it. 80% of people say they hate it. So what you do most of the time, you spend most of your time, either you're working or resting to go back to work, you hate to do. Only 10% of marriages are authentically solid, good, happy marriages. Only 10%. And how do they know that? Because when they've asked thousands of people worldwide, if, by the way, you had a choice to marry her or him again, nine out of ten said no. So now, what you're doing most of the time working, either resting the work or working, 80% of you don't like, then 90% of you don't like when you go home. <laughs> so no wonder we have you know, a whole other way to look at disease. So wonder, <laughs> you're eating pork chops every day and ice cream. <laughs> You're not going to jump off the you know, Brooklyn Bridge. That's too dramatic. There's on average a 50-point reduction in cholesterol in just two weeks. That's at Hippocrates. Listen closely. This is a most recent random study I did, picked at random people who stayed three weeks in our program. That's what the program is, 21 days to change people, their mind, their attitude, their biochemistry, everything else. 50-point drop in cholesterol. Nobody has achieved that. Why? Because raw food does an awful lot more than cooked vegan food. Cooked vegan food takes away the bad stuff. But what does it give you? Doesn't give you the enzymes, doesn't give you the hormones, doesn't give you the phytochemicals, doesn't give you all of the things that actually radically shift fats in the body. You need the rotor rooter. You need the garbage to be taken out. It's not just what you take away, it's what you put in. High uric acid reduces 100% of the time. Where does uric acid come from? Animal foods. That should be surprise. You get rid of animal foods, guess what? Uric acid goes away. What does uric acid cause? Everything from rheumatoid problems to kidney disorders to acid reflux. And all it is is you're eating the wrong thing that you should never have eaten to begin with. Because at school they taught you to do this. Your mother taught you to do this. The government taught you to do this. Nutritionists taught you to do this. Dieticians teach you to do this. Everyone is wrong. 
You say, could that be true? Yeah. They've been wrong about a lot of things along the way, you know? Plant-centric consumers dramatically reduce changes of enduring cancer, chances of enduring cancer, heart disease, diabetes, etc. Organic, raw, vegan food consumers dramatically heightens the potential of this result. So I'm taking you to the place we all have to go. I'm not here to tell you, only become a vegan. I'm telling you to become a vegan who eats nutrition. Because if you cook the food, you're not getting nutrition. Now, anyone who doesn't know that, let me explain it to you. Because I'm going to go in a couple of slides that will show it to you. Now, this is a scary thing. Although we're killing ourselves, we actually do more harm to the earth. Isn't that pretty scary when you think about it? Just look at some of the things that are going in circles there. Animal agriculture is responsible for 18% of greenhouse gas emission, more than the combined exhaust from all transportation. Governments won't tell the truth. You know who has to do these studies? The United Nations. Because they realize that your government is soft-pedaling and promoting corporate greed and perception. So UN came in and said, by the way, if you take every plane, every truck, every car that uses fossil fuel, consuming animals produce more greenhouse gases. Livestock and their byproducts account for 51% of all worldwide greenhouse emission. Now how do livestock do it, do you know? Yes, they do pass gas like you do, but they, they admit it. I've never known a human who doesn't pass gas, but none of you admit it. That wasn't me. Who the hell was it? There's only two of us here and it wasn't me. <laughs> it was you. But how about they don't kill these animals on Long Island? Do you know how much a piece of land here in Long Island costs? How many of you live in Long Island? Raise your hand. You don't want to be a farmer, a rancher in Long Island. You'd have to be a very, very rich rancher. You'd have to be like JR or something at that point. <laughs> and one of those big pickup trucks that costs $100,000. Yeah. So they grow this stuff in South America with poor ranchers. So now they have to send down jets and fill the jets up with the flesh of these animals so you can fly them back here and put all the fumes in the atmosphere and all that type of stuff. But you never think about that because you're getting cheap hamburgers at the fast food joint. When I was a kid, they were really cheap. You think this stuff is cheap now, like a dollar meal? That's a joke. I used to get 20 hamburgers for a dollar. That's not a joke. Hamburgers, when I was a boy here in the New York City area, from White Castle, were five cents each. How many of you are old enough to remember that? And I took advantage of that. <laughs> Animal food cultivation produces the most vile greenhouse gases. Nitrous oxide, listen to this, almost 300 times, 300 times more dangerous than carbon, and it lasts in the atmosphere for 150 years. So we all say, oh, you're, I have a Prius, great for you. But are you still eating hamburgers? Still eating chicken? Still eating fish? Oh, you mean even fish? You mean he's going to talk about fish? Yes, even fish. Harmful emissions are expected to increase by 80% by the middle of this century. What did I just say to you? It's bad now, isn't it? 80% from now. Earth's ecosystem is unraveling, producing septic conditions that amplify and increase human disease. So why does that man have a four-year-old child with cancer? And why is the number one killer of our babies below five brain cancer? Brain cancer, because of what I'm now talking about. Because you are off track. You're consuming things you should never have put in your body. And just because people you know and your families did it, doesn't make it right. Remember, slavery was at one point accepted. How many of you accept slavery now? But guess what? We have more slaves on the planet Earth today than we've ever had in the history of humanity. Because once we change the channel and we don't keep our eye on the ball, it happens. 
There's more slaves on the planet Earth today, as I speak, than there was in the 18th and 19th century. How many of you know that? Never keep your eye off the ball. 80% of grains are grown to feed animals. And then we consume the animals. So we have hunger, we have starvation. You have 700,000 children to 750,000 children in the United States of America. For those of you listening around the world, we're the richest country in the world and probably the greediest. Because we have three quarters of a million children going to bed hungry in this country of the United States. Every night. Why? Because 80% of the grains globally, not just the United States, in France, Germany, everywhere in the world, is fed to animals. And every one of those pounds of grains I can produce through germination, 10 pounds of medicine and food. The strongest medicine ever discovered in the history of humanity is in sprouts. Sprouts challenge what I say. Bring these doctors up here. Try to get them to challenge what I say. And guess what? Sprout medicine costs nothing. <laughs> That's why you don't hear about it. That's why I yell about it. We've been using sprout medicine since 1956. All organic seeds can be germinated containing the highest digestible protein. What did I just tell you? You want protein? Sprouts. Vitamins. Sprouts. Essential fatty acids. Sprouts. Minerals. Sprouts. Hormones. Oxygen. Phytochemicals and enzymes. Sprouts. You cook them, kaput. Worldwide starvation would be ended within three years. This I know for a fact. I sat with a statistician. Three years. If we could convert the food, the millions of dollars of seed discarded to keep artificially low prices. So every single year in the United States, every single day, we discard hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds of seeds. So we keep artificially low seed, uh, grain prices. How many of you knew that? But every developed country in the world that has an economy does the same thing. And I'm telling you, if you just give me what we throw away. Guess what we throw away? I'm not asking for another thing. And give me three years, we'll wipe out world starvation. And by the way, create the strongest medicine ever discovered in the history of man called a phytochemical, a phytonutrient. So am I just talking about you feeling a little better? This is a lot bigger than you, man. You making the right choice is a right choice for everything. It's God's choice. It's universal choice. It's the right choice. And until you're ready to take responsibility and do the right thing, you're part of the problem. How about cooking? Let's talk about it. I touched on this earlier. Cooking destroys nutrients and life-giving elements. This increases the need to consume more food, creating a domino effect of greater food consumption. As Anna Maria said today, year after year, decade after decade, we asked the group, said Hippocrates, by the way, these are not health-minded people, many of them, they're sick. Sure, a lot of you do come because you're smart enough to come to take holidays and stay young. But a lot of people we work with are sick. They've been eating McDonald's. They've been eating garbage food. And we never ask a group after four days they're there, are you hungry? And one person has said yes. Because if you eat food that has nourishment in it, substance in it, everything that I've just mentioned plus things we have yet to discover in it, you're satiated. But when you cook the vegan food, how many fat vegans do you know? I know plenty. I know plenty. And they're usually making fruit smoothies. <laughs> Fact. These are three things we know absolutely happen when you cook a food. These are not opinions. And anything I tell you is scientifically validated to a point. It's unquestionable. Unquestionable. We've known for about 80 years that if you cook a food, Something called leukocytosis happens. It's created when heating foods 
including plants at a high temperature, this weakens the overall immune system. So when you put a cooked organic plant that you've heated to a high temperature in your body, the immune system attacks it. The same way it would a cancer or a virus. Write it down, it's called leukocytosis. Nobody talks about that. Heating oils. When I was a little boy, they discovered. I was a little boy in the 1950s. They discovered, literally, that you heat oil, it causes cancer and heart disease. But you're being told by the latest health authority, oh, by the way, heat coconut oil, it's the best. Why? Because he likes Thai food. Let me tell you something. Coconut oil will give you the same heart disease and cancer, maybe greater amounts coconut oil will give you. Because it's a saturated fat. That's all it really is. Today, Brenda touched on this, and she was right. But she said it was in potatoes only. Wrong. Potatoes are one of the main culprits. Not the only culprit, though. Acrylamides, which my wife's country, about three and a half decades, discovered, and everyone poo-pooed it. Oh, the Swedes. You know, the Swedes are only the Swedes. Well, Christ, they created a Kia <laughs> and Volvo and H&M. <laughs> now, in my books, I write for the scientists, for the doctors. I quote study after study from all over the world, including in your country. They're finally catching up with acrylamides. You cook any food, I don't care if it's an organic food, I don't care if it's a plant-based food, at a high temperature, you get acrylamide, it causes cancer. Not maybe causes cancer, could cause cancer. It does cause cancer. So here I'm telling you there's three things we know cause heart disease or cancer just from cooking a food. Oh, well, that's not what Dr. Schmuck said from the University of Stupido. Yes, well, maybe look at his credentials. Dr. Schmuck, P.H. Schmuck. Moderation. This is something I just learned when I was putting this together. I was stunned. I didn't know why people's limbs were falling off when they had diabetes. Had part to do with leukocytosis. Brand new science to me. Shocked. So, you know, when they get diabetic conditions and the blood doesn't flow and then their toes get black and they get gangrene, and then before you know it, the doctor says, well, I've got to exhume it. Well, I guess just part of the thing. It's genetic. <laughs> Do you know that 100% of diabetic type 2 conditions are reversible almost immediately? You're going to hear Dr. Cousins, Anna Marie, and I speak about our deep experience with this. I don't work with type 2 diabetics who do what we say that they don't make themselves better. And it's a major multi-billion dollar industry. Billions of dollars. I, you diabetic, it's the rest of your life you're going to take the medicine. Complete bullshit. 100% of people can recover from that stuff. Let's do another study. Forget the studies. How many people have to get better before you know it's right? Everyone wants to be an AK. Let's do more studies. They all are impressed with the studies they do. When the heck are we going to get with it? It's like those of you who call yourself religion. You can recite Ritual and rhetoric, but you don't apply it in your life. That's what science is like today. No different than religion. It's like a new religion. The religion of science. Oy, let's sit into science. You end up with losing a limb from cooking food. As Anna Maria pointed out, the latest studies surprised us. We thought that the only reason you got blood sugar conditions from eating animals, and it is one of the reasons, the fat from the fish or the chicken or the red meat or the pork cover the cell so the sugar couldn't go in and get burned up. Now we realize that actually the animal fat creates a spike in insulin 30 to 50 percent higher than carbohydrates like bread and pasta and potatoes. Listen to that. So I never just stopped at bread, pasta and potato. I would slap meat on the bread. So, I'm lucky I didn't get diabetes, right? Resolution. Consume fresh organic plant fare, high sprouts, which can be a minimum of 75% of your vegan diet. Now, how do you eat 75% sprout? You never ate a sprout. You juice them. That's what we do. People say, oh, is it better to eat it or juice it? Well, shit, I can take five pounds of sprouts and juice them and drink the thing like that. As long as I drink it. Don't you think that's better than five ounces? How many of you know five ounces are not as good as five pounds? Raise your hand. <laughs> now, you can't juice it and let it sit all day because you had the right juicer. That doesn't work. That's baloney. That's baloney too. 
Maximum nutrition, including phytonutrients, can be gained by consuming 24 to 36 ounces of raw green juice daily. If nothing else you learn from this conference that I'm giving today, please get a juicer, a proper juicer like the Norwalk or one of these juicers, and every single day take sprouts, and if you want to be a wussy, put more than just sprouts, cucumber, celery, leaf, leafy greens in it, and juice it. You're going to be transformed. We see it every week, every year, every decade since 1956. Take only plant-derived whole food supplements. My book, Supplements Exposed, show you. The original supplements were all plants. They ground them up. They put them into powders. People ate them. People got better. It reversed disease. As Linus Pauling said in 1968, Linus Pauling, every disease has a nutritional deficiency component to it. Not one disease, not any disease. We've been proving that clinically for 62 years. Fact, 80% of human disease is attributed to epigenetic lifestyles. Who told us that? Well, I can tell you that out of all the archives of science in my experience, but guess what? The National Institute of Health have told you that. The government of the United States Institute basically said 80% of diseases you create from lifestyle. But they don't go to the next step. They just provoke thought and do no action. Ritual and rhetoric. Ritual and rhetoric. The science of nothing, I call it. The dead-end science. The checkbook science. It's really used today more so as a sales ploy than it is really to get anywhere scientifically. Human survival depends upon embracing organic agriculture, exclusively consuming plant-based foods, and compassionate living with our fellow creatures. Now, all of you that have dogs and cats and still eat animals, shame on you. Shame on you. Why could you ever take that leap to the other side? Here you are kissing your dog. Some of you sleep in bed with your dog. You have cats all over the place. They have cat ladies. <laughs> and you're out there eating chicken. Well, how many of you grew up, and I won't make you raise your hand, where you had raised animals and then you slaughtered them? I wasn't one of those people, but along the way I've met a lot of people that said, when I was a little girl, when I was a little boy, I became really friendly with the cow. And then I heard the cow scream and I could never eat meat after that. Maybe we ought to take all of you out to the slaughterhouse here for a day. Be an instant cure. If you don't have time to go to the slaughterhouse, look at the wonderful documentary film that I, I promise you will scare you out of consuming animals called Earthlings. Earthlings. So Anna Maria could only watch 20 minutes of it, and she cried. I cried several times and went back three times to watch it. But this was a wonderful Woody Harrelson who took his lots of money and snuck into slaughterhouses, including kosher slaughterhouses, by the way, and showed you what a fraud that is, the top kosher place in the United States of America. Don't buy the nonsense. Nonsense is nonsense. You can never change it. So people have been coming to the Institute for over 60 years. Not with only disease, but some people come to prevent disease. Some people come to prevent aging. But other people have come and they've been able to adapt the lifestyle and reverse catastrophic disease. We're not lucky like a doctor's office or a hospital where people come when they're first sick most of the people we work with who are sick, medicine has failed them, including natural medicine has failed them. Because most natural medicine is a joke to begin with. Go to the average natural medicine doctor, they do all of these tests, and say, chelation therapy, chemical vitamin C, go home and eat fried chicken. They don't want to change you. They want to extract money from you. And they don't know any better. They don't know any better. I'm not here to say everyone is wrong. It's just we're not right enough. Do you follow? I'm not right enough. You're not right enough. And we should always try to be better and know more and open more and enjoy more and love more. And until you are really happy, you haven't reached your goal. 
Remember many years ago, maybe 30 years ago, I was on with Gary Knoll. We all know Gary. Gary is very smart and very arrogant, but anyway, <laughs> he's one of the smartest people I've ever met, I can tell you that. <laughs> but Gary always knows what questions to ask. So at that point, I was relatively young, 30 years ago. I kept saying, complete health. You're going to get in complete health, complete health. And so he, nobody had ever asked me what I meant. So he said, what is complete health? And thank God my mind shut off and I said the right thing. If you can always shut this off, you'll say the right thing, because that talks. You ever see the lips on your heart? They're much bigger. They look like, you know, Angelio lips on it. I'm giving you a lot of fantasy today, right? <laughs> and I said, I don't care if you're 18 years old or 108 years old. Whatever you dream of, you're capable of achieving. That's what true health is. That you don't have dreams you're not able to achieve. You only have dreams and realities that you're willing to create. Do you know what the difference is there? And it makes you alive to fulfill your goals, to pursue your passions, to become a contributor rather than a drainer and a complainer. We've all been taught how to drain and complain. Oh, I'm sick, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm sick. I'm... Are you dying or sick? I'm sick and sick and dying and dying. It's so rare you see somebody that's happy. They sort of like are weird. They're enigma. How are you? I'm really happy. You say, what are they, on drugs? <laughs> Something must be wrong with them. They're really happy. Because the whole world, you've got to be serious and burdened and mean and tough and angry and judgmental. And then you have substance. It's called insecurity. So as individuals and as a human race, as we become more insecure, we become more judgmental, more compartmental, more isolated, and more fearful. And that's what you see humanity going through today. We are at a point in human history where you either have to liberate yourself by doing all the right thing, or again, you're part of the problem. And I think almost everyone is part of the problem today. You've got to be brave, man, to be happy. Because it's not cool to be happy anymore. <laughs> not cool to be happy. Many years ago, one of my great loves, uh, I love all kinds of music. I studied jazz as a kid and played in jazz bands, and I play in rock bands. We still bring bands in, and we play for the guests at Hippocrates, rock bands. But I love classical music. And Haydn is one of my favorites. I always loved Haydn. You know. Haydn was really like, bop, ba -da, bop, 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 you know, all this wonderful stuff, Haydn. And I have this friend who's like a classical music uh, critic, and he was very arrogant with me. You know, about 10 years ago, he said to me, oh, you like him? Well, he had a good life. That's probably why you like him. I said, maybe that's why he played happy music. <laughs> but you have to suffer to do the right thing? You don't have to suffer. Just because your mother and father told you you had to suffer doesn't mean it's right. Society tells you you have to suffer. You don't suffer, you know, go to the gym. No pain, no gain. Now, if they told you the truth, nobody should suffer. Everyone should be happy. You should be having fun all the time, and you should be a contributor. Nobody's going to tell you that, because everyone thinks the opposite. Everyone thinks that life is painful, that life is hard. Life is not painful and hard. What's hard is your head. What's hard is to change. That's what's hard for people. We don't like to change, because as sick and as miserable and as unhappy you, as you are, you're afraid to change. I had a friend recently, every time I see him, he complains about his leg. Oh my, he must have been complaining about his leg for the last 25 years. I said, if you tell me one more thing about your leg, I'm going to cut the damn thing off. <laughs> he said, you wouldn't do that. I said, you wait. <laughs> I said, can't you hold a civil conversation with me? I've got to hear about your life. Oh, it used to be this part, now it's this part, and it's over this part, and that part, you know. I said, you know why you have pain in your leg? All you do is focus it on your leg. That's not a nice thing, he said. 
I said, what do you mean it's not a nice thing? It's not a nice thing I have to listen to the shit about your leg every time I see you. I said, until you get over your leg, you're always going to have a leg problem. So he goes by a week later, he calls me up. He said, all week I've been determined not to think about my leg, and it's still painful. <laughs> I said, where is it painful? He said, back where it began. <laughs> do you follow what we do? Your mind is unbelievable. Your mind has the capacity to do anything you desire for it to do. But what you have to do, you have to engage your heart and your soul. You have to engage your joy and your happiness. And you've got to get to a point in your life where you anticipate and expect that the normal state of affairs, the normal state of mind, is to be at homeostasis, to be at a place of peace, a place of strength, a place of total, absolute competence. Isn't that amazing? But you say, I don't want to be totally competent. If I'm competent, that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work not to be competent. Who's going to take care of you if you're not competent for yourself? Who's going to take care of you if you don't do the right thing? The doctor? The doctor. The doctor. I mean, you think the doctor who's ever trained to take care of you doesn't know how to take care of himself. So it's time in history, a very important time in history, that we as a human race are going to flourish and we're going to thrive. And we're going to move rapidly forward in the right direction. Anna Maria showed you today what all the futurists, what all the great thinkers, what all the Nobel laureates that come together and speak we will transform to a holistic culture if we can just get over the next 15 to 20 years. It's inevitable. This is not overly optimistic. This is mathematically the equation that fits. We have two choices. Either to abandon the human experience and let our species fall, which will happen if we don't take charge, or allow the organic process to occur where what we're talking about here at The Real Truth About Health is going to be what everyone does. And I can assure you that doing what I've done long enough and watching last year that almost a thousand percent improvement and increase in veganism worldwide, that this is going to happen. And because of people like Stephen Shore, The Real Truth About Health, and many others and many of the doctors and scientists you're going to be sitting here and listening to over the next few days, I'm sure it's going to happen. And because of my children who don't believe what I believed, they don't think the institutions of deception are real, I know it's going to change. I know because of my seven grandchildren that I must do everything in my power, everything in my power, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to allow the world to be a much different, kinder, loving place for them to be. And it is not a big thing for that to happen. It just takes you learning a two-letter word. It's a global two-letter word. When they come to you and say, I want you to participate in this, you have to say no. I want you to be part of death, disease, dying. You have to say no. When basically people say, come on, you used to do this, why don't you do it again? You have to say no. It's really easy to say no. It's seductive to think yes is the right answer. It's very seductive. So thank you for listening. God bless. And I hope all of you make a transformation. <laughs>